Hello, bio students. As the title says, this lesson is going to be on population genetics. And it's here that we're going to look at how the genetics of a population is going to change from generation to generation. We already know that for any given gene, there are different versions of that gene or different alleles that do exist. And one of the things that we're going to do is take a look at how the proportion of these alleles within the population is going to change from generation to generation. And also taking a look at the genotypes and the phenotypes, the proportion of those and how they would change from generation to generation as well. So the example that I'm going to use here is taking a look at a human example, the ability to taste this chemical here, the long name, phenylthiocarbamide, or simply abbreviated PTC. Apparently, you can either taste it or you can't, and it is controlled by one single gene with two different possible alleles. If we take a look at the table that I have down below here, so I have identified the two different alleles. So remember that we use a capital letter to represent the dominant allele for this trait. So the ability to taste this chemical PTC, it in fact is dominant. The inability to taste it is the recessive version, and of course that is the lowercase t. So what I'm also giving here in the center is the frequency. So when we do talk about population genetics, we quite often deal with frequencies as opposed to fractions or ratios or percentages. For some people, though, it's easier to think in terms of percentages. So if you just want to take whatever frequency like this one here and multiply it by 100%, that converts it into a percentage. So what this is then saying is that the dominant allele within this population that I'm talking about here, it is making up 45% of the alleles within the population, or again, 0.45. And the remaining 0.55 is made up of the recessive allele. And again, that would just simply convert to 55% of the alleles within the population. Remember that if there are only two possible alleles, um, that does have to add up to a total of one, or add up to 100%, as it does show here. One other thing that I'll also point out, notice that for this particular example, the recessive allele, in fact, is more common within this population. And that's perfectly fine, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, the dominant allele, there's a very strict definition of dominance, and what that means is that that overshadows the recessive allele. But that gives no indication in any way whatsoever as to how common it is within the population. So certainly the dominant allele could be more common, but in this case it is the recessive allele that is more common, slightly more common within this population. So we're going to be talking a lot about this in calculations and using some specific population genetic symbols. So these are two of them right here. These are all lowercase, uh, so a lowercase p. That is the symbol that we use to represent one of the alleles. And if it is a dominant recessive relationship, the P is for the dominant allele. So when we start to do some calculations, the lowercase p is the symbol that we use to represent the dominant allele, which in this case is the capital T. And the other one, the lowercase q, that represents the recessive allele. The table at the bottom takes a little bit further, so here, what we have are the different genotypes and the phenotypes that go along with this particular trait. So three different genotypes, of course, we can have homozygous dominant, we can have heterozygous, and we can have the homozygous recessive as well. And of course, because the ability to taste is dominant, whenever we have a capital T, they're going to show the same phenotype. So if I jump over to the third column here, the genotypic frequency, so what this says is 0.20, or 20% of the genotypes within this population are homozygous dominant, 50% or 0.50 are heterozygous, and the remaining 0.30 or 30% are homozygous recessive. But of course, these ones here are going to look exactly the same, even though they have a different genotype, or rather they look exactly the same, have the same ability, which is the ability to taste this chemical. So if we just add these together, of course, that gives us the 0.7 or 70%. So within this particular population example here, we have 70% of the population that can taste this chemical and 30% that cannot. The final column, these are the population genetic symbols 
for the different genotypes. So again, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but the P squared is specifically for the homozygous dominant genotype. 2PQ is for the heterozygous genotype, and Q squared is for the homozygous recessive genotype. Just like we did with um, Mendelian genetics and the Punnett squares, the point behind the Punnett squares to, was to make a prediction. So that's what we're going to do with population genetics as well. So I have here, what about the frequencies for the next generation? So yes, in other words, we're making a prediction. So I am going to show you a couple of Punnett squares, and that's really just to make the connection between what we already know, which is drawing Punnett squares and making the prediction for a next generation, between the male, male and the female, and then we're going to make the connection between that, of course, and with population genetics, and how things are a little bit different with population genetics. So the numbers, they may differ than the actual population, so the numbers that we saw on the previous page, that was the actual population, and now we're going to predict for the next generation. It might be the same, it might be different. If it is different, all that really means is the population, yes, it is changing, it is evolving over time. So the Punnett square that I have here, I have the female gametes at the top and I have the male gametes at the side. It doesn't matter. I could have flipped them around. This is really, really important for this Punnett square that I am going to draw. This is not just for one male and one female. This is for the entire population. So remember, for a population, we're talking about a specific species. In this case, of course, it's humans. It's in a given area and it's at a specific time. So this would be for a defined human population. And within that population, we know what the um, real frequencies are, genotypic frequencies, and that's what we saw on the previous page. So when I'm drawing this Punnett square here, it's not just for one female. So where I have here the female gametes, this is collectively the eggs for the entire female portion of this population. So just like we did with the previous Punnett squares, though, what we put at the top here are um, the alleles. So here I have one that's dominant and one that's recessive. We make a lot of assumptions. So one of the assumptions is that because we have within the population different alleles, the capital and the lower case, the dominant and recessive, we assume that in the female gametes, there are going to be a bunch of them that have that capital T and a bunch of them that have a lowercase t as well. But again, it's not for one female. It is collectively the entire population. And exactly the same thing that we're going to do for the sperm. So now, in the Punnett square, again, just like we did before, the intersection, this would be homozygous dominant. We're going to get the two boxes at the corners that are the heterozygous individuals. And then the last one is going to be for homozygous recessive. What I'm also going to do in here, though, is at the top, not only am I going to have the letters for those different alleles, but I'm going to write down the numbers that we saw as well. So we saw that the dominant allele was 0.45, the frequency within the population, and for the recessive one, 0.55. And again, we're going to be making a whole bunch of assumptions, and we're going to assume that it's exactly the same when we're talking about the sperm. So 0.45 or 45% of the sperm will have the dominant allele, and 0.55 will have the recessive allele. So now I'm going to add something else in each one of these boxes, just like the box is the intersection between the column and the row. So what I'm going to do is just multiply these two together, and I'll only write down all of the details for the first box. So in terms of the numbers that we have, that's 0.45 times 0.45, I'll give you all the numbers here, and this one works out to 0 0.2025. For this box here, it'll be the 0 0.55 times the 0 0.45, and that is going to work out to 0 0.2455. It'll be exactly the same for this one here, 0 0.2455. Now, these ones, of course, are the same. They're the heterozygous individuals. So we can uh, just multiply this number by two or add these together. So in reality, the heterozygous individuals is now going to be 0 0.495. And the remaining one, homozygous recessive, that works out to 0 0.3025. All right, so all of these again, 
they are going to add up to 100%. Those are the only possible genotypes that we do have. So now the idea is to take a look and do a couple of things. First of all, how does it compare to the original population? And if we go back here, we can see that the genotypic frequencies are 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3. And that is, well, pretty much what we have in this Punnett square as well. So this Punnett square is still a prediction, but it is a prediction for again the entire population that is reproducing. And what this Punnett square says is this is what we expect in the next generation. What we see is that the genotypic frequencies, they actually didn't change. If they did change, once again, that just means that the population, well, it is evolving. And we'll talk about various different ways that the population can evolve and where um, we are going to see a change going into the next generation. So the original population, we would then say that um, it was in equilibrium because it didn't change as we went on to the next one. Um, if we don't have the same numbers as the original population, but if we do have a round of what is referred to as random mating that we'll talk about just down below as well, then what that will do is it will kind of stabilize the numbers for the future generations and the numbers will no longer change in terms of the allele frequencies, the genotypic and the phenotypic frequencies. So this is kind of at the heart of this entire presentation, what's called the Hardy-Weinberg principle or the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what this is, is it is a model and models in science they are used to explain things and they're used to make predictions. So that is what the Punnett square did when we did the genetic crosses. It's there to make a prediction. Now it's important to keep in mind that whenever we're using any kind of a model to make a prediction, we make a whole bunch of assumptions. We do the best that we can to get the most accurate prediction that we can get. But we always sort of acknowledge that because we are making some assumptions, it may not be perfect, it may not be bang on, and that's what we're going to find with the Hardy-Weinberg principle as well. So as I did kind of mention, um, allele frequencies and the ensuing phenotypic and phenotypic frequencies or ratios, they actually would not change over time if you meet these conditions here. So what are the conditions that have to be met to truly use this model and have it be 100% accurate? Well, the first thing is you need to have an infinite population size or at least a very, very large population. There can be no migration, no individuals coming in, which is immigration, no individuals going out, which is immigration. There can be no alteration in the gene pool due to mutations. There can be no mutations taking place within that population. This one here quite often causes some confusion Mating needs to be random. So let me explain what non-random mating would be. Non-random mating would mean that um, a male or a female, they actually make kind of a conscious decision. They choose who they would like to reproduce with and who they would like to have offspring with. That is non-random mating, which means if it is random mating, it means that there is no mate selection that is taking place. Okay, so Hardy-Weinberg does say that the mating has to be random. Each genotype, or sorry, each genotype must have an equal opportunity of reproductive success. So in the example that we're taking a look at, it doesn't matter whether the individual is homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive, they need to have an equal opportunity to reproduce and produce offspring. So as I have in brackets here, natural selection does not favor one particular genotype over the other, and that's what gives them an equal opportunity of reproductive success. And this is the assumption that I already made in that first Punnett square. The female and male allele frequencies, they are the same. Okay, so all of these criteria are the ones that I have here. If you go to a textbook, if you go to the internet, you might find that the wording varies a little bit, but this overall, these are the criteria that need to be met in order to truly apply the Hardy-Weinberg principle. But then take a look at the note that I have at the bottom here. I say these conditions describe an ideal non-evolving population that likely never truly exists in nature. 
So why would we use a model that probably doesn't truly exist? In other words, we just can't possibly meet all of these criteria. Well, it allows us to make a prediction. And just like with the Punnett square, it usually allows us to make a fairly accurate prediction as long as we have a fairly large sample size that we're dealing with. So one more Punnett square, and this is truly to show the connection between what we already know, which is drawing Punnett squares and population genetics. So this is the end of the Punnett squares. From this point on, when you're solving population genetics problems, you will not draw a Punnett square because there is a much, much easier way to solve these problems than by drawing a Punnett square. But I will start off just by putting once again in here. Again, this is for the entire population that we're dealing with. We're in the female gametes, in the eggs, there will be some with capital T, some with lowercase d, and the same thing in the sperm. Now what I'm going to do is I'm also going to put in here those population genetic symbols. Again, it's all lowercase. This is the lowercase p for the dominant allele, and this is a lowercase q for the recessive allele. And exactly the same thing for the sperm, our p's and our q's. In the Punnett square, exactly the same as what we already know, writing down the genotypes for our prediction. And now, just like I did with the numbers, I showed that these are multiplied together, so we're just going to take our symbols, P and P, and multiply them together, and that's where we get this P squared. So this is significant. This shows us where the P squared comes from that we're going to use to do our calculations, and it shows that P squared is, yes, the homo homozygous dominant genotype. This is the frequency for the homozygous dominant individuals. Doing the same thing with our other squares. So this is going to be our P times Q, PQ. This one here is also P times Q, which is PQ. And again, we have two of them. So because we have two of them, we can just write that as 2PQ. So 2PQ is the genotypic frequency. Again, it's frequencies that we're dealing with here for the heterozygous individuals within this population. And finally, we have simply the Q times Q or Q squared, the last of the genotypic frequencies. And that one is specific for the homozygous recessive individuals. So that's it for the Punnett squares. And again, hopefully this shows where these letters are coming from that we're using and how we can just translate that into a couple of equations. So the first equation here isn't the Hardy-Weinberg equation, but it just simply says that if we only have two alleles for this particular gene, and that is the case that we have in our example, the capital T and the lowercase t, if those are the only two possibilities, they have to add up to 100% of the alleles, or remember in terms of a frequency, that is what. So we're just saying that P and Q is equal to 1, but really important that you understand what P and Q are representing. P is specifically the dominant allele frequency. So for the T that we took a look at, that number was a 0.45. Q is specifically the recessive allele frequency, and in our example that was 0.55. And again, the two of these together, they do add up to 1. It's this one here, genotypic frequencies, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. This is truly the Hardy-Weinberg equation. And we just saw where these symbols are coming from. So our p squared is specifically for the homozygous dominant frequency. In our case, the two capital T's. 2pq is specifically for the heterozygote frequency, and q squared specifically for the homozygous recessive frequency. And once again, in terms of our example, these are the only three possibilities, so they have to add up to one at the end. This is um, sort of a list of strategies to go through or how to tackle 
population genetics questions. I'm not going to read through all of these with you, but I am going to go through a couple of sample calculations, and I'm just going to apply what I do have here in terms of the steps to take in order to solve the problem that you're given. Uh, this first one here is just a multiple choice. So this is really um, kind of stressing the importance of understanding what are those criteria that need to be met in order to really have the Hardy-Weinberg model principle equilibrium apply. Now take a look at the wording here. So I do have which of the following are not required. So let's kind of flip it around. Let's take a look at which ones are required. So we did already say that there can be no mutations. And of course, that's virtually impossible to control. But that is one of the criteria for the Hardy-Weinberg principle. No mating selection. No mating selection is random mating and that is what we want as well we want random mating population that includes large numbers yes ideally a very large number we want that sufficient migration no it's actually not sufficient the hardy weinberg principle actually says there can be no migration so that means that this one here would be the one that is not one of the criteria for the hardy weinberg principle so the first example that we'll take a look at here, we'll just do two of them together, and I'll kind of model for you how I would go through, how I would read this problem, and how I would translate it into uh, the equations that we have in order to solve the problem. So this is another human example here. So the ability to roll the tongue is what we're dealing with. And it says that it's controlled by a single gene. And again, pretty straightforward, only two different alleles. So exactly the same sort of thing as what we just saw with the PTC. The allele for being able to roll the tongue. So this is what I would do as I'm reading through. I would just write things down right away. Okay, rolling is dominant. So what do I already know how to do? Take a look at the first letter of the dominant trait, roll. I'm just going to capitalize it. And that is the symbol that I'm going to use to represent the dominant allele. Over the other allele, the other one then is not being able to roll. So being able to roll is dominant. Not being able to roll is recessive. So this one here, same letter in R, only now, of course, it's going to be a lower case. We have to have some numbers to do our calculations. So these are uh, relatively easy numbers that I'm giving you here. So fairly large population size, 10,000 individuals. So in a given population, we have 10,000 individuals, and there are this many that are the non-tongue rollers. So it's really easy to sort of uh, lose track of what it is that you're trying to figure out. So again, I like to write things down all along the way. So 2,601 are non-tongue rollers. What do I know about the non-tongue rollers? Well, being able to roll is dominant. So we have three different possible genotypes. We can have the big, big, we can have the big, little, and we can have the little, little. Whenever they have the big R, they can roll. These ones cannot roll. So these individuals that we're talking about here, they are the ones that are the homozygous recessive individuals. And this is really important for you to be able to pick that out right from the start. We don't have any frequencies here. What we have here are raw numbers. So you need to take the raw numbers and convert it into a frequency. Simplest way to do that is one number divided by the other. The numbers are, the frequencies are always going to be one or less than one. So what that means is we need to take the smaller number here, 2,601 non-tongue rollers, and divide it by the total. So when you do that, it converts it into a frequency, which is 0 0.2601, or approximately 26% of the population um, are unable to roll their tongue. So these are the different genotypes. But remember that we have population genetic symbols that go along with them. These are the allele symbols, but we have population genetic symbols that go along with them. So going along with the capital R, the frequency would be a lowercase p. Going along with the lowercase r, the frequency would be the lowercase q. The homozygous dominant is the p squared. Heterozygous is 2pq. And homozygous recessive is the q squared. So this is kind of critically important. What frequency are you given? Well, we're not given any, but we just calculated a frequency.
there are five different possibilities. There are five different frequencies. There's the allele frequency for the dominant allele, the allele frequency for the recessive allele, and the three genotypic frequencies. So you have a one in five chance, but hopefully you're not guessing, what is this frequency? Well, that's why I like to write all of this down because I already answered the question. Those are the individuals that are homozygous recessive. So this number here is Q squared. We just calculated Q squared. And the nice thing about Q squared, if we kind of go back to what I didn't go over in detail with you, big hint, usually you're given Q squared. And the reason for that is that once you have Q squared, as we'll see, it's really, really easy to get all of the other frequencies. So can you now determine the allele frequencies for P and Q? Well, if we have Q squared, Q is just the square root of Q squared, which is the square root of 0 0.262601. And again, I'll just give you the number for that. So that works out to 0 0.51. And by the way, you should save all of these numbers in your calculator until the very end. So in fact, this is um, all of the digits that you will have for this one. But if you have eight digits, you should save them all in your calculator and don't round your answer until the very end. So now we have Q. Now remember that you only have P and Q, so they have to add up to one. P plus Q equals one. So if I want to get P, I just need to go one minus Q equals P. So one minus 0 0.51 is going to give us 0 0.49. So now I have P as well. So I have Q squared, this one right here. I have Q, I have P, and if I have P and Q, I can just quite easily find these other ones. P squared gives me the homozygous dominant frequency. 2PQ gives me the heterozygous frequency. So the question here says, assuming that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, how many heterozygous tongue rows? So we want to know heterozygotes and the frequency for heterozygote, which is going to be these for our symbols. And that, of course, is the 2PQ. And I have P and Q. So I'm just going to take 2 times our P, which is a 0 0.49 times our Q, 0 0.51. And this is going to give us the frequency of heterozygotes within this particular population and at 0 0.4998 really really close to half the population which are heterozygotes but always go back to the original question the question actually isn't asking for the frequency it says how many tongue rulers are there so out of the 10,000 individuals how many are tongue rulers so I finally I just need to take this number and multiply it by 10,000 to give me the actual predicted number. And remember, this is a prediction. This is what we think, based on the numbers that we do have, this is what we think we're going to have for the number of heterozygotes. So that works out to 4,998. That is our prediction for the number of individuals within this population that would be expected to be heterozygous. And we could do the final calculation for P squared as well. And that would give us the expected number for homozygous dominant. We'll take a look at one more here. So this last one, it's kind of similar. Uh, so in this population, I'm not even saying what exactly it is, but we have the dominant phenotype. So a little bit different here. So make sure you understand what we mean by allele, allele frequency, genotype, genotypic frequency, and phenotype. Remember, phenotype and genotype, they're not the same thing. So individuals that have the dominant phenotype, remember they can either be homozygous dominant or they can be heterozygous. So if I just pick the letters A, so if we have someone that is homozygous dominant, and if we have someone that is heterozygous, they both have the dominant phenotype. Okay, they would look the same. The only ones that look different are the ones that are homozygous recessive, and they would then, of course, have the recessive phenotype. So what are we told? And again, this is where you need to read really carefully. So the 91% is not for one particular genotype, but it's for these two together. So this is the 
91%. I'm just going to convert this to a frequency right away. So if we divide it by 100%, that converts it to a frequency. So that means that 0 0.91 are going to be made up of homozygous dominant and heterozygous. Now what you can't do is make the assumption that it's evenly split up between the two. That may be the case, but it's probably not the case. So this number in itself then actually isn't that useful because we don't know out of this 0 0.91, what is the frequency for homozygous dominant and what is it for the heterozygous? So it might be 0 0.11 for this and 0 0.80 for this gene type here, or it may not be. But what we do know is that the 0 0.91 plus the frequency of the homozygous recessive has to add up to one. So now, just what goes in this box here? Well, if we take one minus 0 0.91, that gives us the remainder, which is our 0 0.09. So now we have the frequency of something that we know for sure, and that is the homozygous recessive, which again, our starting point is the Q squared that we have for this one. Okay, and again, this is just going to be 9% if you want to think in terms of percentages. Now it's just exactly the same as what we did before. So Q is equal to the square root of Q squared, which is equal to the square root of 0 0.09, which is equal to 0 0.3. We have Q. P is equal to 1 minus Q. So that's going to give us our 0 0.7. Okay, again, P and Q, they have to add up to 1. So now we have P, now we have Q, we have Q squared. We can figure out everything else that we need. So this one just simply asks for the frequency of carriers within the population. So that's the ones that are the big little, the heterozygotes. And that, of course, is the 2P Q. We already have the P and the Q, so it's just our 2 times our 0 0.7 times our 0 0.3, and that gives us 0 0.42. 0 0.42 or 42% of this population. This is our prediction again, it is a prediction, but we would predict that 42% of this population would be the heterozygotes.